the age of 25, I was hopeless, homeless, and addicted. My story hadn't always been like that, though, quite the opposite. I was born in a middle to upper class loving family. I had opportunities to travel the world. I was graduated with honors in my senior class. I got the Senior Art Award and most likely to be remembered Senior Superlative. I played travel soccer and I took competitive dance from the age of three through high school. Seems pretty normal, right? Even privileged. But the reality was I still didn't feel whole. I had always used dance, art, and music as my coping skills. So in high school, it made it easy to turn to recreational drugs for relief. It allowed me to not have to worry about those feelings where I felt like I felt less than those around me or where I felt like I felt deeper than other people and my peers. I turned to drinking and smoking cannabis and just doing what I thought were normal, typical teenager things. But due to my careless behavior, at the age of 17, I became a young mother. Prior to this, I had gotten accepted into a prestigious arts department at Appalachian State University, but I didn't go due to the birth of my first child. I stayed home in the small town, Wilkes County, the hometown of NASCAR and Moonshine, the place I'd always dreamt of getting out of because I thought that's what you had to do to experience life. I stayed and had dreams, so I found a way to just keep those alive and be a mother. I went to cosmetology school and found a way to put my art to use in another fashion. I also taught competitive dance to kids ages 6 to 18, winning numerous choreography awards. So I found a way to keep my dreams alive in Wilkes County. That lasted until an ankle surgery where I, I had five surgeries due to an ankle injury, and I was prescribed opioids for pain. I remember the first time I took this medication at home. I was in a wheelchair. I was bed rest and I was in a grave depression because I couldn't teach dance anymore. I couldn't do dance, I couldn't do hair anymore and I was struggling just to be a mother. I remember the instant euphoria this drug gave me. I fell in love with it instantly and then it, with myself all over again. Um, it was an instant love affair. I continued to chase that feeling for a long time. I had learned what it felt like to be dope sick when I didn't have the medication. And I also wanted to keep that mind state that opioids gave me of this all-powerful and whole woman, uh, which is the feeling I got when I took the medication. Eventually, my doctor became the drug dealer down the street. Lucky for me at the time, I had a husband who knew all the right people, the people for years that I'd tried to keep him away from. It was easy for me to blame my chaos on him for a long time. As I said, from the outside looking in, I was a responsible mother. I taught dance to children and won awards, and I was, I, I was the one bringing home the money and working full time. And so I felt like I had it all together. From the outside looking in though, it looked great, but for me, I still felt miserable, empty, and and depleted. The scary thing about the disease of addiction is that it always progresses. And the crazy part about it is, is that I, I, I went downhill so rapidly that by the time I looked in the mirror, I didn't even recognize the person looking back at me. I was sitting in an empty apartment. The house that I'd bought at the age of 21 foreclosed. My husband now in jail, my job's now gone, and my mother was now taking full custody of my children. And you would have thought that this would have been rock bottom. You would have thought that once everything was out in the open, that that would be as far downhill as you could go. But that wasn't the reality for me. At this point, I was forced underground into a world that I'd never existed in before. A world that was all about survival, 
a world where my only responsibility was to numb my own pain and most days pray that I didn't wake up again. The, the best way I know how to describe it is I was alone in hell with the rest of the only other lonely people who suffered with me. I always tried to stop using. There was never a moment where I want that that's what I envisioned or wanted my life to continue to look like. But despite my best efforts, I was never able to mentally or physically make it through the withdrawal symptoms. And so despite my best efforts, every time I tried, I was still homeless, hopeless, and addicted. This is usually where most people's story ends. So most people don't, don't live through the disease of addiction. In 2021, the CDC estimated that 100,000 individuals, just like me, died due to overdose death. Imagine the entire Charlotte Motor Speedway filled up on a hot, slam-packed race day. That still doesn't account for the number of lives that we lost due to overdose, which is preventable. Lucky for me, that wasn't the way my story ended. In January of 2012, I ended up in the hospital in ICU due to septic shock because I had become an IV drug user. I was in the hospital for almost 14 days while doctors tried to control the infection that had spread to my heart and basically just keep me alive. I remember when I woke up in the hospital for the first time in a long time, I was grateful that I was not dead. It was the first time I'd woke up and not prayed that I was not on earth. I was happy to be in the hospital. I think this is probably what saved my life because like I shared, despite my best intentions, I had never been able to make it through withdrawals. I was so desperate to not go back to that hell I was living in that I decided to go anywhere somebody told me I could go, honestly, to not go back. Um, I ended up in detox, inpatient treatment, and going to transitional housing, but I had to leave Wilkes County in order to do that. We didn't have services for people like me. You didn't even talk about addiction then. So I uh, I had to leave Wilkes. A little context on Wilkes. So Wilkes County is located in the foothills of North Carolina. It is the home to Lowe's and furniture manufacturing. When the jobs went away, Wilkes County became the epicenter for the opioid crisis. But what Wilkes County didn't have was recovery services for people like me. So I made it part of my mission when I returned home to not force people to have to leave where they grew up, their community, their family, and their friends to get the help that they desperately needed. I want to share with you a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. It says, first start by doing what is necessary, then do what is possible, and before you know it, you'll be doing the impossible. It was necessary for us to have services in Wilkes County. We had nothing for people to, to recover. And so I set out to open Wilkes County's first transitional housing facility. This was no easy task. I'm from a rural community where everyone, almost everyone, told me it was impossible. I remember taking my business plan to my boss at the nonprofit I worked for at the time, hoping that he would merge it under his mission. And I remember him blatantly saying to me, Wilkes County won't allow it. And so I use that as my motivation to change Wilkes County's mind. After a lot of advocacy and a lot of telling my story and sharing the stories of others and some friends and community members who knew we had to have solutions, it was passed. In 2016, I went on to register us with the state of North Carolina to become a nonprofit organization, Wilkes Recovery Revolution. We formed the nonprofit because I realized early on that I had a really hard time telling people like me no because they were indigent or didn't have access to funds. And so it was important if we wanted to keep doing this work to be able to accept community donations and to accept grants. 
just like with that, every time that we hit a roadblock, we tried to figure out how to get into a solution. So not only now were we doing what was necessary, but we were also looking to see what was possible. As a result, Wilkes Recovery Revolution now has eight unique programs under its umbrella. Phases Transitional Housing, R3 Recovery Center, Hope Warriors, Wilkes Harm Reduction Collective, Wilkes Fresh Mobile Market, Fresh Start Farm, and Revolution Thrift Store, and Project How Healing Our Workforce. We created these programs so that regardless of where someone came to us on their journey, they wouldn't fall through the cracks. So if, if some, a person who uses drugs needed support, we were there. If somebody needed employment or housing, we were there. And so we learned that if we meet people where they're at and provide the services that they need, that people get better. I wanna tell you a story about Tiffany. Tiffany is a mother and a veteran. When Tiffany came to us, she had been sleeping out of the back of her car and was homeless. Tiffany ended up coming into our programming to use our recovery center as a daily ha safe haven to ensure that she didn't return to use while she waited a long time for a treatment bed. She ended up going to inpatient treatment and coming back to Wilkes County. And when she did that, she decided she wanted to give back. She started volunteering, which eventually worked into a paid work-based learning opportunity with our organization. Tiffany was able to earn short certifications, become a peer support, and ultimately go back to school to finish her college degree in business with an accounting major. Tiffany now is a mother. She has full custody of her child. She lives independently with her child and spouse. She's getting ready to get married. And she also is our organization's bookkeeper. I believe in this concept because it worked for people like me and people like Tiffany. And it works for so many others. I believe that it truly works because we allow individuals to self-direct their own pathway of recovery and make choices that empower their own health and wellness. I often wonder how my story might have been different had I had access to these services. I often wonder if maybe I wouldn't have been pushed so far underground and disconnected from my community. I often wonder if I wouldn't have carried the shame and guilt that kept me out for so long. And I often wonder if maybe I would have gotten better sooner. I share my story today because I think it's important that we not recover in silence. I think silence has killed way too many people. I think we cannot afford to remain anonymous anymore, that we must share our stories and speak up and speak well. I believe that addiction is the opposite of connection and that individuals must feel connected to their community. And the community must do what it needs to, to to offer that connection. We must work together if we want to solve a complex problem like addiction. I take you back to a quote that I shared earlier. And I hope that you listen to this and are able to put it into action in your own life. I would encourage you that if you're wondering what you're supposed to do in this, in this life, in this world, and how you can make a difference, to first, just do what's necessary. Do what's right in front of you. Do what you notice and know will make an immediate difference. But don't stop there. Continue to search and see what your community needs to heal. See what you can do to continue on and do what's possible. And I promise if you do that, you, like me, will look back and realize that you're doing the impossible. If you had told me over 10 years ago that I would be standing on this stage doing a TED Talk when I was sitting in that old apartment, devastated, and with a syringe in my hand, I would have told you that you were crazy. I would have told you that that wasn't possible. But it is possible, and I had people come before me that carried their message of hope, and I hope to continue to do that so that individuals do have the opportunity to recover. Today, our community is creating a, com our, 
organization is creating a community where recovery is not only possible, but it's probable. So again, my name is Devin Lyle today. I'm an individual in recovery, and I shouldn't be the exception. <laughs>